House in this crucially important year. Your reputation, Madam Speaker, goes before you. Your renown as an erudite, compelling and indeed inspirational speaker is internationally established. I had for my own part the great pleasure of being in Washington DC last year, around the time you delivered an eight-hour address to the House of Representatives. <laughs> Madam Speaker, may I suggest that such a level of generosity is not expected <laughs> of you today. It is an honour, though, and a pleasure, as Count Corla, to welcome you to the Houses of the Oireachtas. The strong and enduring links between our two proud nations need little restating. Few people in Ireland do not have immediate family links with the US, and it is entirely appropriate that a politician of your stature and experience should be with us here this afternoon to reflect on those links between the United States and Ireland particularly over the past 100 years. It is a great pleasure to have so many members of the House of Representatives travelling with you to Ireland, so with each of them with so many deep links and affection for this country of ours. So, Ked Mila Falcha to you all. 100,000 welcome. <laughs> I am gratified that a few short weeks after we marked the 1918 general election, which granted votes to women, certain women that is, we have such a strong, able and authoritative female public, public representative here today. Many glass ceilings remain to be shattered, and it should be remembered that the vote for women was fought for and won with tenacity and bravery, rather than given freely. And your presence today, Madam Speaker, serves to show the distance we have thankfully travelled, but we are mindful also that there remains a road left to walk. One hundred years ago, in the Mansion House, just around the corner from this chamber, 27 men gathered in the first oil with the purpose of creating a new nation-state out of the fragile remnants of a broken Europe. If such a term can exist, I would suggest that our Dáil forebears were practical idealists. They knew the challenge facing them, in particular standing up against the might of a strong empire. But the men and the women of January 1919 sought to place their fight for independence in an international context. There were only 27 in attendance, as the rest of those elected uh, on the Sinn Féin platform uh, the previous December were on the run or imprisoned, and these included Constance, Countess Constance Markievix, the first woman elected to the British Rep Parliament, refusing to take her seat in London and opting instead for membership of the first Dáil. Two years previously, in 1917, an Irish manifesto was presented in Washington, D.C. to seek the support of our American friends for our project of independence. Ireland's fight for liberty was placed cheek by jowl with America's fight for freedom almost a century and a half earlier. As well as past assistance and current person-to-person -person links that mean so much to us here in Ireland, Ireland and the U.S. continue to work closely in trade, in investment and education, among many other important areas of common interest and concern. Long may such links and connections continue and thrive. And as Count Corla, I am particularly anxious to see parliamentary engagements between Leinster House and Capitol Hill nurture and strengthen. Those Those who met to convene the first Dáil in January 1919 issued a message to the free nations of the world in Irish and French and in English, and a democratic programme which called for liberty, equality and justice, as well as an adequate and equitable share of the nation's wealth and resources. The past century has seen Ireland change and evolve into a country which would perhaps be unrecognisable to those who sat in the Mansion House in 1919. We have taken our place among the free nations of the world, 
intrinsically linked to the European project and deeply proud of our role in UN peacekeeping. We are outward looking and anxious to welcome those coming to our shores temporarily or long term. We have sought to create an inclusive, tolerant society, mindful of our own rich heritage, but respectful of all difference. We still have many challenges facing us, and we have some way to go yet to be the fair and equitable society which we all strive for. But we have travelled that path with international friends and allies. Our friends in the United States Congress have been steadfast in their support for us over the past 100 years, particularly with regard to the Northern Ireland peace process. That help and support from America was crucial to the success of the fragile peace and delicate process over two decades ago, and it continues to be of vital importance today. I want to avail of this opportunity to renew our thanks and the thanks of the Irish people for that outstanding statesman, Senator George Mitchell, and the very many supporters of Ireland and of peace on Capitol Hill. <laughs> that support, Madam Speaker, will long be remembered with the deepest gratitude. We face major challenges now in light of the United Kingdom's decision to leave the European Union. I am delighted that this senior delegation from the House of Representatives, led by you, Madam Speaker, have taken time to visit us to see at first hand the implications for us of a difficult Brexit. As Count Corla, in this anniversary year of the First Doyle, I wish to thank you, Madam Speaker, and all our dear friends in the House of Representatives for your support, past and present. We are very pleased to have you and your distinguished delegation here with us today for this unique occasion. And now, Madam Speaker, I'd ask you to address us. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of this very distinguished, crucial body at this crucial time, is that the appellation you gave, Mr. Speaker? It is my great honor, my great honor to address you in this storied institution in this 100th year of its founding. Thank you for your invitation to join in the festivities. On behalf of the American people, it is my privilege to deliver the, be the well wishes of our nation as, as you mark this extraordinary century and to extend congratulations to the doll uh, from the Congress of the United States. I am deeply honored to have the privilege as speaker to address you today. And I am also very honored to have so many of our colleagues with us today. Uh, the Don Aaron is the People's House, same as the United States House of Representatives. Here in this house, the voices of the people are heard and their will is heeded. When President Kennedy, the first American president to visit Ireland while in office, addressed you all, he declared, our two nations are divided by distance but have been united by history. I'm proud to be here again with a distinguished delegation of leading members of the US Congress to celebrate that shared history President Kennedy referenced and to strengthen, strengthen the enduring bonds of friendship between our two nations. Our delegation remember, uh, represents every corner of America from sea to shining sea. Led by Chairman Richie Neal of Massachusetts, Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, and Co-Chair of Congressional Friends of Ireland, Richie will be delivering uh, the Tip O'Neill John Hume uh, Lecture at uh, Ulster University, where he will be awarded a degree. Richie Neal, I. As you know, Mr. Speaker, a real fighter uh, for Ireland in the Congress of the United States. John Larson of Connecticut is here. Uh, Brian Higgins of... 
Does their applause come out of my time? <laughs> <laughs> because you... Brian Higgins of New York, a scholar on Ireland, who is... Brian is writing a book on Michael Collins, and as a New Yorker, he wanted to remind that the Fighty 69th flag that President Kennedy brought here when he came as president really is a product of New York. The New Yorkers are very proud of that. Joe Courtney of Connecticut. <laughs> Susan, De Susan Del Bene of Washington State. Dale Dale Kelsey of Michigan. <laughs> Stephen Horsford, a freshman member of our delegation from Nevada. <laughs> and Brendan Boyle, the only member of Congress with a parent, his father, born in Ireland. We travel uh, during Holy Week, a Holy Week tinged with sadness, with the tragic fire and one of the greatest jewels of faith, history, and civilization, Notre Dame de Paris. We pray and extend our gratitude to the brave firefighters who controlled the damage as much as it was and were able to save lives in many of the wonders of that cathedral. We are, we are here, we are deeply honored by the extraordinary welcome we have received. Uh, from our very special meeting with the Taoiseach to the warm greeting of the Tornista, uh, to the beautiful presentation of the sweep of Irish history and the vitality of Irish culture that we enjoyed last night at the GPO, uh, to the invitation to Dublin Castle tonight. Thank you for taking the lead on this magnificent welcome to Ireland a beautiful and magical land, but you know that. It's also a personal honor for me today, uh, when my husband and I, my husband Paul is here, uh, and I do not have Irish grandparents, we do take pride in having Irish grandchildren, Liam, Sean, and Ryan <laughs> Keneally. <laughs> They were baptized at the Kilkway Church in County Wicklow, uh, the same church where their grandfather was then uh, buried from. And my son-in-law, Michael Keneally, is with us somewhere here, Michael. And, uh, and they always, rem that whole family, they always remind us of the exuberance of the Irish people. For a generation, our legislatures and leaders have had the opportunity to celebrate our friendship and the friends of Ireland, at the Friends of Ireland luncheon that we have around the time of St. Patrick's Day it was started by Tip O'Neill, Speaker Tip O'Neill, and President Ronald Reagan the first year. The second year, the Taoiseach became part of that celebration, and that has been the way it, that way ever since. Uh, when I offered the Taoiseach uh, after that, after that luncheon, I offered the Taoiseach a tour by the Speaker of the House of the Capitol of the United States. The Taoiseach, who once served a congressional intern in D.C. as part of the Washington Ireland Program for Service and Leadership, said, Madam Speaker, I used to give that tour. <laughs> <laughs> so we have many connections, personal, official, uh, professionally, and then the way. And today I'm honored to return the warm message of friendship that he brought on behalf of the Irish people. It's also a message of appreciation and recognition of the role that the Irish played, the leadership role the Irish played to build and to strengthen America. The Irish were so soldiers in America's first, in the war for independence. So strong were they of such bravery that a British officer lamented, we have lost America through the Irish. The American, uh, in America in the 19th century, Irish workers built our canals, ports, railroads, Irish bricklayers built our hospitals and schools. I think many of them, when they left Ireland, heard the rumor that in America the streets were paved in gold. Little did they know they would be paving those streets when they got to America. The Irish served in Lincoln's army to preserve the Union and to save our nation. I mentioned the flag of the Fighty 69th Irish, Irish Brigade that President Kennedy brought when he came. And the Sisters of Mercy came from Dublin to heal our sick and to teach generations of American children, and they still do. Both our nations know the joy of independence. Both our countries endured the traumatic experience of civil war 
and the satisfaction of rebuilding our nations. And it is these mutual experiences that our nations affirm for each other and to the world our dem democratic values and commitment to freedom. When Ireland proudly proclaimed its independence, our people stood together. I take great pride in Jeanette Rankin, the first woman ever elected to the Congress of the United States, our American counterpart, perhaps, uh, to your Countess de Markiewicz. Uh, uh, Congressman Rankin introduced one of the first resolutions on Irish independence, a resolution calling on America to count Ireland, quote, among those countries whose freedom and democracy we are fighting for. And when your constitution came into effect, members of Congress from both sides of the aisle, both sides of the Capitol, this has always been a universal value for us, sent a message of goodwill uh, to express our, quote, ardent congratulations on the birth of the state of Ireland, a copy of which the, Tush the Taoiseach brought uh, to, uh, to Washington last month. And I've told my colleagues uh, that is in the speaker's office. Uh, they can come see it any time. I may have to have a time check on it because everybody's <laughs> looking at all of the names who signed that uh, in the mid to late uh, 30s, you know when. In Ireland's Freedom Fighters, America saw our own founders, men and women of courage, confidence, and conviction. They, we saw that in your Freedom Fighters who shared our belief in liberty and justice for all. That belief is that another connection why the American abolitionist Frederick Douglass and the Irish freedom fighter Daniel O'Connell found solidarity and friendship in their shared cause for freedom. It is why African Americans in their fight for equality a half century ago inspired nationalist community in Northern Ireland to fight for their dignity and equal rights. We inspired each other. And that is why a young Michael Collins found inspiration for his vision of a new Ireland in the work of the poet laureate of Mer American democracy, Walt Whitman. It is said, in fact, that Collins was known to have carried, frequently carried with him Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Indeed, it was, Ireland is one of the youngest nations with the oldest civilizations. You are a land of perseverance, one with a rich and storied history of conquest and famine, tragedy and triumph, heartbreak and, heartbreak and heroism. And you are a land of progress, whose people forged prosperity from poverty, internationalism from insularity, and diversity from homogeneity. From the crucible of deprivation and famine, Ireland has emerged as a confident and ascendant nation on the forefront of innovation in a modern global economy. Today, the Emerald Isle is firmly a world leader in green technologies and the clean economy, even pioneering methods to harness the tides of the great seas that break along Ireland's legendary coast. Your leadership continues to be essential in a world threatened by the climate crisis, recognizing that our future prosperity depends on bold action for sustainability. But we know, both of us know, that Ireland and the United States must do better and we must do more and we can do it together. It is a challenge that we must all meet together with the fierce urgency it demands. This is a public health issue, a decision for clean air and clean water. It is an economic issue for creating good green jobs of the future and a way that will create opportunity and reduce income inequality in our society. It is a security decision to keep us safe. We were in a Stuttgart before we came here and uh, the generals there told us that climate is a national security issue throughout the world in terms of the challenges that it creates. And it is a moral decision. If you believe, as I do, that this is God's creation, then we have a moral responsibility to be good stewards. And even if you don't share that view, we all know that we have a moral responsibility to future generations to hand this planet over in a responsible way. So I hope that we can work together in a very special way because Ireland is big enough to be impactful, small enough to be agile, and educated entrepreneurial to show the world smart growth. We can learn a lot from you. As President Kennedy said, he said, the supreme reality of our time is our indivisibility as children of God 
and our common vulnerability on this planet. The beauty of Irish innovation and Irish thinking has long stretched around the globe, but you probably know uh, that there is a serious recognition that the Irish have a way with words. <laughs> it's been said by the Irish, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Ireland produced the world, for the world some of the greatest writers of poetry and prose the English language has ever known. William Butler Yeats would redefine poetry. James Joyce would redefine the novel. Samuel Beckett would redefine theater. Seamus Haney would win a Nobel Prize for his own lyricism and introduce us, I love this one, to one of our oldest English texts with his masterful translation of Beowulf. Have you read that? It's a masterful translation of Beowulf. And in modern times, another purveyor of the, of the word from Ireland, Bono and U2, one of Ireland's most beloved exports, whose music and mission <laughs> Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm not finished. Whose music and mission of advocacy stirs the spirit of the world while embracing the pride of the Irish home. We've learned so much at YouTube concerts about what's going on in Ireland. And we were delighted to see Bono in the galleries of the GPO last night, a picture of David Trimble and John Hume at a YouTube concert in, in Belfast in 1998. And Abano is here with his wife, Ali Houston, who is there. Thank you both for being here. I take pride in saying that I'm one of the members of Congress who's been to more U2 concerts than anyone. Now he's in the audience. <laughs> thank you, Ali, and thank you, Bono, for being here. And give my regards to the rest of you, too, to Edge and others. <laughs> Uh, something I learned from my children, from Michael Keneally and then my grandchildren. We all know, all. I usually do not intrude on the music of my children. That does not apply to you, too. <laughs> you. Out of the past of in inward struggles, the Irish Republic became a bold and impactful presence doing good around the world. It's a funny thing. Inside, outside. Perseverance, progress. Old civilization, innovative. You have continued, you were early pioneer on nuclear non-proliferation, sponsoring a vital resolution at the UN in 1961 to oppose the spread of nuclear arms. Early, leaders, visionaries. You have continued to take the lead on peace and the global peacekeeping and humanitarian missions that are filled with and led by Irish men and women. And during our visit, We've heard, a great, we've heard excellent arguments, including some of what I just said, on why Ireland should sit on the UN Security Council. What do you think of that? From the roots of heritage and history, a modern Ireland has blossomed. What a powerful statement that Ireland, steeped in tradition, would be the first nation in all of the world to deliver yes to marriage equality for LGBTQ brothers and sisters. Not by a ruling of the courts and not by an act of the legislature, but the overwhelming vote of the Irish people themselves. And further, the people of Ireland voted to affirm the reproductive rights of women. Ireland shows the true strength of a nation with the confidence to open itself up to new ideas, new people, and a new future. Indeed, Ireland truly is a nation with a century to be proud of. Ireland's story is one of hope. Hope, how with vision, courage, and faith, we can build a brighter, stronger, and fairer future for the next generation. And that is all of our responsibilities to make the future better for the next generation. And this month, we mark the anniversary of one of the greatest achievements of that spirit of hope and the faith that a better future is possible. The signing of the Good Friday Accords in 1998, ending centuries of conflict. 
On that holy day, the world saw the dawn of peace in Northern Ireland, of which few had ever dared to dream. With the diplomatic leadership of President Bill Clinton, who sends you his regards when he found we were coming, and Special Envoy Senator George Mitchell, uh, with the courage of John Hume, whom my family, Paul and I and our children, were honored to welcome to our, our five children uh, to our home in San Francisco in the late 1980s. He told us that night, quote, as we bring down the walls in Belfast, we must also bring down the walls in our hearts if we're going to have peace. We were happy to welcome him to our home, and with the bravery of our late friend, the extraordinary Martin McGinnis, whom I was pleased to welcome to the House of Representatives uh, as the top Democrat, when I was the top Democrat on the Appropriations Committee, which had control over the funding for the International Fund for Ireland. So Martin was a regular visitor to our, uh, <laughs> so home or house, uh, Martin is beloved and missed by his many friends in Congress. And with the hopes of the people of Northern Ireland and all of us in America, we witnessed the miracle of a new peace. We treasure the Good Friday Accord, not only because of what it has meant for Northern Ireland and for Ireland, that would be reason enough. We treasure the Good Friday Accord because it is not just a treaty, it is an ethic, it is a value, it is an article of faith for us, it is a beacon to the world. We treasure Good Friday Accord because of what it says is possible for the entire world, a reason to hope that in every place that dreams that reconciliation will be possible for them too. It showed us, as President Clinton said, what is possible when you decide to give your children not only your yesterdays, but their own tomorrows. As my friend George Mitchell said after the signing, patriotism has to do with keeping the country in good heart, the community ordered by justice and mercy. With good heart, guided by faith in justice and mercy, America will continue to stand with you in protecting the peace that the Good Friday Accords have realized. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We must ensure that nothing happens in the Brexit discussions that imperils the Good Friday Accord, including but not limited to the seamless border between the Irish Republic and Northern Ireland. Let me be clear, if the Brexit deal undermines the Good Friday Accords, there would be no chance of a U.S.-U.K. trade agreement. I say that hopefully uh, that we would not have to face that reality, but I say it as a prediction. As you face the challenges posed by Brexit, Brexit, know that the United States Congress, Democrats and Republicans in the House and in the Senate stand with you. Especially now, as the first generation born into the hope of Good Friday. Imagine, Bono, since that night you had David Trimble and John Hume at the, at the U2 concert. Children born then, 21 years old now entering their adulthood, knowing peace. We cannot jeopardize that. We, we must not and we will not allow that progress to be undermined. For generations, Ireland has been the emerald thread in the fabric of American history and national life. America is grateful for your partnership, the partnership we have together, glad to share in the joy of this centennial and looking forward to another 100 years of Irish leadership in the world. As the great Seamus Heaney wrote, Seamus Haney, Haney wrote, and this I see all over Ireland, well, all over Dublin so far. Once in a lifetime, the long for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. Together we can make hope and history rhyme once more. Thank you for the honor of your friendship. Thank you for the honor of addressing you this afternoon. 
May God continue to bless America. May God continue to bless Ireland. May God continue to bless the partnership that we share. Thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs>
I wish Speaker Pelosi and her delegation well in their visit to Northern Ireland, where she will see at first hand the peace and political stability brought about by the Good Friday Agreement, and which we must all work to protect into the future. Gormila Mahogav.